Hello, everyone. I'm Andrew Cullum with Shibuma First Nation Council in Sioux Lookout, Ontario. I'd like to welcome you to the home heating session presented by Dustin Salkers, who is the owner of Rainbow Car Wash in Sioux Lookout, Ontario, the hub of the North. He was born and raised here in the North and has been heating in the heating industry since 2007. Previously working as a heating technician for Morgan Fuels, Dustin's ha Dustin has extensive knowledge in heating oil and furnace oil tanks and has spent numerous winters in northern communities. So he understands the unique, unique difficulties and challenges they are facing. Dustin will discuss the pros and cons of different types of heating systems, sharing his passion and expertise with participants to help them make informed decisions on staying warm in the north. All right, Andrew, thank you very much. Uh, hello, everyone. As Andrew said, uh, I'm Dustin Salkers with uh, Rainbow Service in Sioux Lookout. And uh, I guess we can start off with uh, talking about uh, oil and oil furnaces and tanks. Um, we'll do some pros and cons of each one. And, uh, and we'll start with some pros for oil. Um, so oil up north is, uh, is readily available. Um, you know, most of the heating is done by either wood or oil up north. Um, parts are readily available as well. Um, so, so that's good, a good pro for, for oil furnaces. Um, oil right now is, uh, is relatively cost effective. Um, their, you know, supply and demand is, is, uh, good this time of year and, uh, oil. And oil is also heading towards um, biofuel, so so that's good for the environment. Um, it's it's a more sustainable uh, resource than just normal oil, um, and it is growing. It is a growing technology uh, in the fuel sector. Uh, also, liter uh, liter per liter, uh, oil does have more BTUs than propane. Um, some of the cons, uh, oil is a non-renewable resource, so once we get it all out of the ground, that will be it. Um, it does have issues uh, in extreme weather uh, in northern communities with flow, so gelling in pipes and oil filters, uh, you know, that's, that's definitely a problem. Uh, it does have a very extreme environmental impact uh, if it is mishandled. So if there's leaks or spills, uh, the, the insurance costs are very high to get those cleaned up and it is very hard on the environment. Uh, if the appliances themselves are not serviced regularly or properly, um, they can have major, or that can have major issues uh, on the efficiency of each appliance. Uh, they can cause um, CO poisoning uh, which is a very big concern if the units are not properly managed. Uh, so that's a big, big concern for northern communities which are remote, uh, do not have a lot of access to certified heating technicians. Um, but we do our part and uh, keep everything going as best we can. So insurance costs as well, uh, they're, they're probably the highest to have insure, insurance for oil and oil tanks due to the costly cleanup uh, if there is an issue. Um, so that's, uh, that's some of the pros and cons for oil. And now we'll go to uh, propane and natural gas. So again, with uh, propane and natural gas, um, the, the pros are a little bit similar as with oil, you know, parts and appliances are readily available. Um, another pro is propane and natural gas does burn cleaner than oil. Uh, they do require a little bit less maintenance uh, as they do burn cleaner. So, so there's not as much soot and carbon uh, in the furnaces and chimneys as there would be with oil. Uh, the cost per liter is less than oil. Um, for some of the northern communities, it may be more comparable due to the, the cost of transporting it, you know, over ice roads or flying it in. Um, the units for propane and natural gas are usually a smaller size uh, than the oil because they, they are 
uh, more efficient. So, so the burners are smaller, the chambers are smaller, uh, which is a, a bonus for basements with limited space. You know, there's a smaller footprint uh, in the basement. Um, insurance companies do like to see propane and natural gas over oil, um, uh, from my knowledge, because again, the, the cleanups, if, you know, if there's a propane leak, it dissipates into the air as does natural gas, but with oil, it does have very big, uh, environmental impacts. So some of the cons, uh, for propane, natural gas, uh, Again, with, with this, if, if not properly installed uh, or serviced, uh, can cause CO poisoning, which is a, a big concern with these units. Um, you know, if, if, uh, if the gas line's not tight, if it's not burning properly, uh, if the venting is not properly connected, there can be leaks into the home, which can cause uh, serious injuries uh, up to death. Um, the another con for these units, I don't believe there is natural gas anywhere in the northern communities. Uh, we don't have it here in Sulacout, but propane is making its way up there. Um, I know that there is a few companies that are starting to deliver and some communities are changing over. So uh, it's becoming more readily available, but still not as available as uh, what fuel oil is. And as with fuel oil, propane can uh, have flow problems, does have flow problems in extreme cold. Um, it can gel up and does not vaporize properly, you know, after minus 40. So, so there's some of the pros and cons for propane and natural gas. Um, we can move on now to electric. This, this is the one that I believe insurance companies uh, like the best. <laughs> um, but some of the pros, uh, again, with, with no chimneys or venting to go outside, uh, basically, as it says, uh, most, almost all of the heat made is going into the house, or sorry, all of the heat made, um, as there's no chimney to lose heat up. So uh, there, there is a large, power line going into most northern communities as well um, you know with with lots of communities at their max uh, max capacity for their generator systems now they're not able to put in electric furnaces but now with the new power line being uh, being constructed uh, this might open up a, a whole new way of heating for the north with new electric furnaces going in as they'll have uh, the power grid to support it. Uh, as I said earlier, the, the insurance companies uh, do love this type of heat uh, because there is not much to go wrong uh, as far as environmentally or cleanup. Um, so, so they do like to insure electric over, uh, over propane or oil or wood for that matter. Um, there is very little maintenance with an electric furnace. Um, there's no, you know, proper setup for combustion, uh, pressures, temperatures in the chimney, things like that. It's basically switch it on and change your air filter. Um, not to say that there is uh, no maintenance required. They do have a blower motor and a fan, which again needs proper maintenance, but it is, it is very minimal compared to oil or uh, propane. They are very quiet when they're running as it's just the blower, not the, um, not the uh, burner and such. So there's also no worries about CO poisoning or smoke in the house, which is a very good thing. Uh, as far as perforations in the house, uh, there is no extras because there's no chimneys, venting or intake. So, so there's no extra uh, holes in the house for leaks or anything like that. Uh, some of the cons for the electric, I said, uh, I mean, a little bit more specific to Northern communities. Um, the house does need to have an upgrade electrical panel of at least 200 amp to support the electric furnace. Uh, a lot of older homes only have the 100 amp service, which uh, makes it more difficult to install these, these furnaces. Uh, in my opinion, uh, electric does not feel, and I use that in quotations, as warm as oil or propane. Uh, 
What I mean by that is a 70 degrees uh, for an oil furnace to get the same feeling in electric, you might need to go to 72 or 73 degrees. Uh, it just feels personally different to me. Um, everyone feels that heat different, but, but it does, uh, I thought it was a, a note worth mentioning. Um, these units can be expensive to run. Uh, I know electricity is always going up. Um, so uh, that's, that is a, uh, a concern when dealing with electric heat. Um, like it says, the, they are efficient, but it doesn't mean they are cheap. So, so that's something to keep in mind as well. And uh, it says uh, can require constant professional repair. So this is more, I would say, a, a maintenance thing on the blower as well as uh, the blower wheel. So they need proper oiling and cleaning. But other than that, uh, unless an element or a sequencer fails, there's not much to go wrong with them. So uh, as it says, yeah, they, the cases are very rare. And the new ones are built, uh, Ontario government has mandated that all, all furnace blowers now are ENERGY STAR rated. So, so that is a, a good thing as well for energy savings. So now we can move on uh, to boilers and pros and cons about boilers. Um, so they, uh, they are definitely efficient uh, at heating large buildings, uh, as it says, even, even heat distribution. So if they are sized properly and the heating runs are in the floors or uh, on ra uh, rads on the wall, it definitely heats much uh, more evenly than say a forced air unit. Um, they can be connected to uh, uh, outdoor wood or wood pellet boiler systems as well. Uh, you know, so they can be a, an add-on or a backup to a larger unit that is, is outside, uh, outside the building. And, <clears throat> excuse me, and it says uh, can be combined with uh, to heat multiple buildings. So they do have a uh, newer in-ground pipe that can withstand the Canadian winters and very minimal heat loss when it's transferring from building to building or from heating unit outside uh, to the building. So there's, there used to be old pipe that would, uh, you would see the snow melted above ground where the pipes were ran because it was losing so much heat. But now uh, that's not the case with, with new insulate, or sorry, new insulation uh, ways of insulating the pipe. So uh, some of the cons, uh, they are, they are, uh, fairly specialized. Uh, they are complicated systems. Um, they do require special training uh, to diagnose and repair. Um, so it's not the most simple of systems by any means, as you can see with the picture. Lots of controls, uh, moving parts, uh, pumps, valves, etc. Um, they take up a lot of wall space. Um, so there's, there's that. Uh, if if glycol is not used in these systems, uh, there is a great potential for freezing. So glycol is a definite need. Uh, that is something that needs to be maintained and kept on site as the system uh, will use that up slowly over the years. So it needs to be topped up at, uh, at intervals that way. And if people aren't uh, aware of that, then yes, the systems can freeze and fail and uh, cause major damage, especially if pipes are, uh, are in the cement or in the foundation. Uh, if they don't have glycol and they freeze, that causes a very big can of worms. <laughs> uh, as it says, the heat recovery can be slow. Uh, you know, if it's used in a garage, we've done lots up north for, for MTO garages and stuff. Uh, it is a great way to heat and maintain heat, but a fast recovery if a big garage door is opened, um, it will feel cold for quite a while after. And usually what we do is put in uh, an air handler uh, facing the door that uses the same hot water, but is, uh, is an air handler in the ceiling that blows hot air to, uh, towards the open door. So those are some of the pros and cons on boilers. And uh, now we can look at the heat pumps. So heat pumps are, uh, are great for, I will say, milder climates, you know, down southern Ontario. 
um, where there is not such big temperature swings. Uh, it says, yep, yeah, pros, you can do AC and heat in one unit. Um, so there is that, that's a bonus. Um, they do take a, a smaller footprint and they are very energy efficient. Um, again, with, with the heat pump as well as the boiler systems, specialized training uh, to diagnose and repair as well as install. Um, they, are, they are quite labor intensive to, to install and, uh, and set up properly. Um, we don't do much of those up north because the, no matter how big we size uh, the heat pump unit, it seems to be when it's extreme cold, we always need to have a backup as well because the ground or the air to air units have only so much heat or cooling capacity, as I say, from the ground or air. And about midway through the winter or sooner, uh, the ground is usually, uh, the heat is sucked out and, and you need another unit to make up for that, that heat as there's no more to gain from the ground. So um, that's the, the units have issues in extreme cold climates. So another one as, as a con is they are very expensive to install. The, the initial installation costs are, are quite high compared to uh, the other three units we've talked about. Um, also, it, it would require multiple head units in, in different rooms or different buildings as well. So that cost would, uh, would increase as such. So that's the heat pump pros and cons. And uh, now we can look at uh, the combination furnace. So usually when we're talking combination furnaces, it's, uh, it's an oil wood or oil propane. Uh, there is also, um, sorry, oil wood, propane wood, or uh, electric wood is usually the combos that, that we're talking about. Um, so with that being said that you have two, two different units, uh, if you don't go get wood that year, but you have oil, it works out great or vice versa. Um, the units uh, are great. You know, they, like I say, you have two, two units. So if one goes down, usually the other one will work and, and keep the house heated or the building heated. Um, some of the cons, the, the biggest con that I see is, is they are big. The ones that we've dealt with, they're, they're twice to three times the size of a propane alone, propane standalone, oil standalone. Um, so they are a big unit. Uh, they need a lot of space. Um, with, with these units as well, they are quite complicated to install. Um, you know, there's, there's two usually separate units to deal with that are ducted together. Um, so basically you have twice the maintenance, uh, twice the cost, things like that to, to keep them going. Um, you know, two thermostats upstairs, lots of wiring and relays to go with that. So um, they, are, they are complicated units, but if they're done right and the customer is showed uh, proper use and handling of them, they are uh, good units as you have a backup. So I like, I like to use those units as well. Um, insurance uh, would definitely be higher uh, with the wood add-ons. Again, you know, if it's uh, electric with a wood or propane with wood, um, insurance companies are a little leery about the wood add-ons uh, just you know, if the customer has little maintenance or, or has not taken care of it properly. So, so there is a cost associated with that as well. Um, so yeah, that's the pros and cons for the that I'll, I'll add to that too, if that's okay. Yes, for sure, Andrew. Yeah, some, sometimes what I find is uh, with the wood part of it, people get a misconception that uh, it's a total backup system for power failure. Yes, and it can work for a short period of time, but it's not recommended for long lengths of time because there are special installation uh, requirements you have to meet. And it, like you said before, it can be confusing for people when they're installing them that they've got to understand that they've got to follow another set of standards as well. Uh, the yes. B365 when they're installing it and making sure that they've got the right clearances and um, it isn't really a solution for a total power outage and you need to with these units you you absolutely have to have dry wood 
um, wood pulled out of the green wood will turn into creosote really, really fast. Yes, that's correct. Yeah, they, they definitely need the blower to, to move the heat out of the units if it's, uh, if it's doing the wood heat side of it. Um, like you say, they are approved to run, but uh, recommended only for a short period as the gravity heat, uh, heat rising will, will heat the ductwork up very fast. And yes, there is another uh, set of codes as well to deal with, like you had mentioned. Uh, the other the other issue too is with a, any type of wood stove that's in a basement, you can have issues with with lighting, uh, back puffing, and things like that. So they're all things that need to be taken into consideration. A fresh air intake is like a combustion air is really really important with these units. And um, I've seen them where they've overheated and warped the doors, and then they don't work properly. And like you said, it's just making sure it's two two units you have to maintain instead of one. Yeah, that's correct. It just kind of doubles the doubles the maintenance required. Uh, again, a great unit. You know, if the customer is uh, is um, versed in in the maintenance and upkeep of these and showing how to use them properly, but but big units uh, and yeah, costly to maintain. Um, you know, especially in northern communities with limited access to technicians and whatnot. Yeah. So that's, uh, that's the combination furnaces. Um, I don't know if there's any questions or... Yeah, we do, we do have a few questions here, uh, Dustin. Okay. Um, I'll start at the top here. So someone has asked, uh, can outdoor wood-fired boilers be a suitable heat source in a remote community? Uh, yeah, very, very suitable. Uh, you know, most Northern communities are surrounded by forest. Uh, you know, so that's that's a good uh, heating source. It just has to be planned out yearly so that there is enough wood on site, you know, to keep the units going uh, and people aren't scrambling in the middle of winter to try to uh, get wood for the for the furnace to keep it going. Uh, what I found is there are some units that are. Um, that have like a blower built into them, so mm -hmm. they they can it's not recommended but they can burn greener wood more efficiently than some units that don't have a blower. Right, right. To reduce the maintenance on creosote and cleaning the chimney and things like that. But you're gonna burn a lot more wood if you burn green wood. You burn over 30% more if you just that's, go grab it from the bush. Yeah, that's correct, yes. If it's not seasoned, <laughs> uh, yeah, it, it creates a lot more problems if the wood isn't properly seasoned. Next question here is, uh, what certification or license does an installer need to have? Um, I guess for which unit or um, just in general? Yeah, maybe if you go through the different heating systems, if you know of which licenses yeah. are required. So so for, for oil, uh, you need to be certified with TSSA uh, and it's called a uh, oil burner technician. Um, you can do three, two or one one being uh, the highest, even though the numbers are backwards. Um, I'm an OBT2, uh, and then there's just different uh, BTU ratings and a few different things you can do uh, with a one versus a two. And then for propane, it's, uh, it's a gas technician, um, three, two, and one, with again, one being the most, most knowledgeable. Uh, for wood stoves uh, and uh, solid fuel appliances, pellet stoves and such, uh, you need to be wet certified. And Angie, you might be able to elaborate a little bit more on that, seeing how you do hold that certificate. <laughs> yeah, it does involve some training. You get your training through the um, WET, which is wood energy transfer training. Um, it's an 80 week. You, you, do your, you do your courses. There's three you have to take. There's... Um, um, it wood, wood burning basics, I think. There's, uh, I, I had the books with me too. I should have put them in front of me. <laughs> but there's three courses you, you take, and they take about seven days to complete. Okay. You can do them all at once, or you can, you can break it up and do it. I did mine in Winnipeg um, in 2018. But then it's 80 weeks after you do your course that you can apply to have your full uh, certification. And there's different, there's different certifications too. There's, there's inspector, there's uh, chimney cleaning, 
there's advisory, and then there's also installation. So there's different certifications you need to have. You can have all of them too. Yeah. You're not you're not limited to one. And they but they don't they don't call it one, two, or three. No, <laughs> not as easy. A <laughs> little bit more complicated. Yeah, I think I think when you're the highest level, they call you a master. Oh. A master wet uh, wet certified person. Good, good. I see a, a note or a question here asking about the lifespan on propane tanks. Um, to my knowledge, uh, uh, propane is regulated by uh, TSSA out of, uh, for, on, for all of Ontario. Um, I'm not quite versed on the rest of Canada, but for Ontario, um, there is no date uh, that, that a tank is good or bad as long as it meets the code. So you could have a brand new tank on one house and one from 1984 and they both pass uh, as long as the 1984 one is, you know, in good shape, not leaking uh, and passes today's code. Uh, what, what limits the dates or the tanks, I should say, with oil and propane is insurance companies and or fuel distributors. So if, uh, if an oil tank or propane tank is, uh, is deemed non-fillable from an insurance perspective, then, then it's no good. Whether, whether TSSA or myself says it's good or not, it, it really is an insurance-driven uh, date on both of those oil and propane tanks. Uh, another question here is, uh, because of the poor burn often associated with outdoor wood boilers, are you in favor of using pellet boilers? Uh, I'll have to be honest. I have not run into that uh, in my experiences yet for pellet boilers. Yeah, the only the only issue I see with pellet um, is if you're remote, now you're going to have to transport it in. I mean, it's, it's the same as fuel, right? It's not something you can get from your backyard. You have to have it uh, in a driven in on the winter roads or flown in, which can really increase the cost, especially if you don't plan ahead. Um, you'd be pretty much the cheapest way to do it in a remote community is buying it the, the, the winter ahead of time, like for a whole year ahead of time. Right. So you get it trucked in. Um, it just takes extra planning. And, and then storage uh, and yeah. keeping it cool and dry you know, would be a challenge as well if you're transporting it on ice roads and such like that. And, and, as, and uh, storing it for the next year would be a challenge for most people as well. They, they do actually have machines that you can make your own pellets, but you need the product readily available. And again, it's storage, right? Right. Because you basically, you'd be putting all your um, wood chips, like if you chipped a bunch of uh, smaller trees, you could, you could put them into the machine, it would grind it all up and then compress it to get all the excess moisture out. But that's a whole other, whole other issue too, right? You need a huge facility to do that. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, it creates jobs and things like that too, which is a, which is a bonus, but um, yeah, it can, uh, takes a bit of planning. For sure. Um, so another question here is, uh, what would be the recommended type of system considering operating and maintenance costs? Hmm. Recommended? Uh, right, right now, I guess I would be a little biased towards oil for, for northern communities. Um, that's, I, I keep saying that because that's where my background is. That's where, where I live, right? Um, uh, to this point, it seems that... Uh, that oil is is the most readily available, um, other than other than uh, wood, I guess, from each community. But uh, but again, that that involves going out, getting it, storing it, all that sort of thing. So, uh, but again, with with the new uh, hydro line coming in, uh, electric may be maybe a more viable uh, option once that's all completed. Um. Do you happen to know what the cost of an electric uh, furnace is? Like the average electric furnace? Um, anywhere between, you know, 1500 to 2000, I would say just, just for the unit itself. 
That's if you don't have to put in the 200 amp service and upgrade your electrical. Exactly. Yeah. And, and with, uh, for around my area, I believe, you know, it's anywhere from 35 to 4,500 to upgrade your, your panel from 100 to a 200 amp. Yeah. I don't, this is a question that I, I was actually going to ask to myself, <laughs> but, uh, have you heard of any rebates? I mean, they keep on talking about, um, you know, carbon tax on certain things. I, I feel this way too, because I have electric baseboard heat and then wood uh, as my secondary heating source. But um, would there be any rebates offered if you had an electric furnace or electric baseboard heat in a house with any of the new government incentives and things like that that are gonna be coming out? Yes, I, I haven't experienced it personally, like uh, signed up for anything like that, but a lot of customers have come to me and, and stated, you know, can you give me a quote on a new electric or uh, also the heat pump system that'll do, you know, each room with, with one or two head units. Um, there has been rebates for those as well from the Ontario government. Um, I'm not sure again, uh, what the rest of Canada is doing, but but there is uh, there is rebates out there, yes, for electric as well as uh, as uh, heat pump units. Another question here: Do you need do you need to be certified a certified technician to install chimneys? I guess it would depend on what type of chimney. Yeah, uh, for for oil, propane, uh, yes, you do. Um, I believe some uh, general contractors, carpenters are installing, you know, wood chimneys outside or through customers' homes, but those would have to be inspected by someone like yourself with the wet certification. Yeah, yeah, that's, a, that's important. I mean, it is, it's just making sure that you follow the clearances. And I mean, I think if that works with propane, um, yeah. natural gas or oil and, and wood, wood chimneys, it's all, very similar is just making sure that you follow the uh, instructions or the or the code if you have to on what your clearances need to be. Especially if you're using single wall pipe for a wood stove, you need to make sure that you follow those. That's uh, <laughs> that can be yeah. a dangerous one. Yes, definitely, definitely, yes. Uh, someone here that said they strongly recommend upgrading the building envelope, insulation, air sealing, HRV, ideally to very high levels of going to electric heat. I, I agree with that. Um, you know what I'm doing to my house to yeah. fix it. It was, a, it was a bit of a disaster with the insulation yes, and the vapor sure. barrier, but uh, yeah, it's a very important thing to, to yeah, do that, I think. Oh, depending on where you are in Canada, um, I, I did come from Alberta and there were incentives for upgrading your insulation, uh, vapor barrier, tightening up your house, right? So, and I don't, I'm not sure of any in Ontario right now. I know there were, but I'm sure they'll be coming back um, maybe federally with all this uh, climate stuff that's going on with the federal government that by 2030 we've got to have you know a lower uh, carbon footprint so they'll have to start putting some initiatives out there. Yeah with with any heating system uh, really no matter how you heat your home or building to me it makes uh, a lot of sense to spend extra money on keeping that heat in the building so windows insulation you know proper roofing um, things like that. It, it makes uh, a lot of sense to me to to not only have an energy efficient heating system, but to keep that heat in your home by having an energy efficient home as well. I know in, in Alberta, the house I had there was built in 19, 1958, and I had six inches of wood shavings in the attic. And I was slowly going through and, and uh, upgrading insulation I had a plumber and electrician look at my furnace and it was original to the house. And they both said, oh, you gotta get rid of that. It's a Fairbanks Morris natural gas furnace. The, the heat exchanger is probably cracked. And I said, well, before you start bashing it, go have a look at it and see what you think. Check it out, make sure it's not having any issues. So they, they checked it out. No cracks in the heat exchanger, it was cast iron. And uh, for me, it didn't make sense to change it at that time because my walls were only two by four. It wasn't until I upgraded the insulation in the walls in the attic and tightened up that, that envelope 
before I decided to switch it over to a high efficient furnace because a high efficient furnace has to work really, really hard in a leaky building. And uh, you, know, you either size it and make it put a bigger furnace in or you just have it running all the time. Which would defeat the purpose of having the energy efficient uh, exactly. heating system, right? Yeah. Yeah. But I did, I did get it inspected every year because I wanted to make sure that heat exchanger was in good condition and it wasn't cracked and I didn't have any leaks or anything like that because you do run the risk of having a CO. Um, you could get CO poisoning. But yeah, and that's why you that's why you have them in your house. You make sure that they're working, and you test them just like your your smoke alarms. Yeah, exactly. And and uh, if if people are going to take away anything from this section of the conference, I, I recommend um, having no matter what heating system you have, having it inspected annually by a certified person or a company and making sure that it is running properly to prevent any issues. Um, that is something that keeps me up at night uh, and it, it, it makes me very nervous. So that's what I would like people to take away is make sure that no matter what it is, uh, that it gets uh, inspected regularly and make sure it's running properly. That's, a, that's awesome. That's, that's how it should be done. It's just an annual thing you get done and um, just on the on your calendar, you you call up and you you book the appointment and it gets done and you're you're not not having to worry about it. Yeah, exactly. Just a, a bit more of a peace of mind. Yeah, exactly. Well, Dustin, I'd like to thank you, and as a as a big thank you, um, we have commissioned a print from the first Na a first nation artist, Daryl Big George, that we'll be sending out to you. And uh, you know how our, our mail system works in Sioux Lookout because we're kind of remote. It, uh, it could be a week, could be two weeks, could be three weeks, <laughs> <laughs> but it, you'll, you'll get it. And next year when you're doing the, the, uh, another session, it'll be in the background on your wall. Well, wow, that's, uh, that's very unexpected, Andrew. And yeah, thank you to everyone who, who put that together. And uh, a very big thank you for, uh, for letting me uh, have my little spiel. I do appreciate being on here with you guys. Thank you very much. Great. And uh, I'd like to remind everybody to write down the code and enter it in before the closing ceremonies so that you get entered into the draw for the Google Chromebook, Yeti products, power tools, and more. And uh, that the code is maintain. So don't, don't forget to, uh, to write that down. And please head on over to the, uh, to the closing ceremonies for the passport to prizes. Uh, th thank you everybody for, for joining us. It was, uh, it was a fun session. We'll uh, see you, see you later on. Take care.